I'm a visual artist and my lecture, my talk will basically give a little overview of uh, my practice in relationship to the topic of the of the day. And I will try to summer, kind of summarize the connections maybe as best as I can for the time that I have. Um, and I would say that um, uh, maybe we can define today's moment uh, in time, but also possibly the summarizing my practice uh, by these two references from uh, 17th century, from the Age of Enlightenment. And that is uh, Paradise Lost by John Milton and um, the early scientific paper uh, that was observing microscopic animals or parasitic animals uh, living in uh, bodies of other uh, of others. Um, and I would like you to keep this as a reference <laughs> for, for my talk onwards. And I will kind of get back to it once in a while. Uh, I started my, um, the first chapter is called approximations. I started my, uh, uh, a practice uh, of art with this maybe very um, specific angle of thinking what are images, what are visual images uh, in relation to biology and human evolution. And it took me to the moment in time where um, uh, some, some subgroup of primates developed uh, an RGB vision that allowed them to see the world in, uh, in three uh, colors in a combination of three colors, which is RGB. And um, uh, the possible evolutionary need for that was uh, for them to identify ripe fruits and uh, thus developed kind of a, an attraction to colorful uh, ripe objects um, that maybe my thesis is that maybe we, we carried it with us uh, and later this, um, this instinct developed into attraction to images and attraction to art and attraction to, um, to sort of funny, interesting, colorful shapes. And uh, uh, this is very summarizing very roughly, um, but what it turned out, turned into in our age, sort of in the last two decades uh, with explosion of, um, internet it turned into kind of a hyper uh, fixation in images and images becoming a new currency and sort of attention becoming uh, a new uh, domain of um, capitalism let's say um, and also kind of and from just a cultural domain it became an economical and an kind of almost an industrial scale domain it's not just we can find pictures in museums and books. It's uh, uh, the, the world is full of images um, on servers, on printed media and um, on our phones all over the world. And that's sort of, that's a norm. And my interest back then 10 years ago was to understand why certain images are more successful than others uh, online, why some people prefer certain images more and why uh, specifically images of nature and animals are uh, one of the top categories in all um, sort of algorithmic platforms like Instagram or Facebook or Tumblr uh, back in the day. Um, and uh, this sort of combination of beauty and something that is alive, it's, it's a very banal reality, but um, it's, it became almost like a technology in itself, like a, uh, like a beautiful animal that, that developed for millions of years uh, through evolution, uh, becoming a picture ends up being a kind of a successful technological object almost that drives attention on online platforms. And I use this um, perspective to create a series of um, sculptures. I took these images, uh, uh, out of the internet and use them uh, to create flat sculptures that were basically cutouts of these very specific signals that work well online um, or in, in general in the cultural field um, as visual signals. 
Um, and the test was that I would, I would see if also in the gallery space, for example, in the context of um, art world, these uh, forms would uh, generate attention and, um, and almost like an affection, kind of appreciation. And the sculptures were very simple. They were just flat and uh, using um, uh, advertisement uh, techniques. Um, and it became a series uh, of works um, that all followed the same logic. Um, And it developed further into the series called Patterns of Activation. And this phrase, Patterns of Activation, also kind of um, uh, goes through my uh, practice. And what I mean by Patterns of Activation is this um, a combination of signals that generates a pattern um, that somehow activates either psyche or um, consumer behavior or uh, some sort of uh, uh, or even a, uh, an algorithmic response. Uh, and patterns of activation became a way to, for me to explain um, kind of complexi complexities of the world that aren't, we cannot explain linearly at the moment, but that they're still happening. Um, I started to make these sculptures that combined uh, flat uh, sculptures with something three-dimensional and in and in the beginning uh, the, the the second object was always this economical growth arrow that also in the uh, first was just digital and then it became physical and I I thought of uh, specifically including this economical growth arrow as this abstract uh, as this abstract of image that is like object that is somehow combining a lot of references together. It combines um, a, an idea of a sh shooting arrow, it combines uh, a mathemat mathematical vector, it combines a, a body of a snake or a worm, and it sort of simulates an idea of a turbulent uh, economy in a very simple form. Uh, and I related it to to what's going on outside of these uh, of the internet, for example, uh, that maybe in some cases uh, there is more um, there would be more images of certain animals online than anim than these animals in the wild. So the number of images of a specific species would be larger than the amount of actual animals of this species. Um, and this I kind of more and more openly try to relate it to environment and environmentalism, but also the relationship between the image of a living thing and um, somehow the ecological reality of that thing. Uh, and include and kind of increasingly materializing also the abstractions around that, like these growth uh, graphs. Um, and this idea how also how we speak about um, growth and uh, crisis in terms of kind of um, agricultural metaphors. So these are just examples of these sculptures. Um, and this idea kind of materialization of a graph itself, like a mountain. These are graphs uh, of Anthropocene. <laughs> uh, and this is sort of a, a relationship between a traffic, uh, online traffic and a mine, a uh, mineral mine. Um, and so um, I kind of reached a point where I understood uh, images as all kinds of images as a way to map uh, what <laughs> what is described as relentless expansion of human spaces or human species um, and map through modeling map through documentation or map through uh, colonization and appropriation of basically any form of wilderness left and I think this project started with um, early enlightenment maybe uh, 
and that's where we kind of uh, that's where the paradise was lost <laughs> um and uh kind of where we are at the moment is the that this process of kind of um introducing images and uh, mapping into any uh, any uh, space that is left not just on the planet but also within our, our human bodies is um, you can use the word colonization but you can also use maybe argue that this is not the appropriate word but um, I somehow see that uh, since kind of humans covered the earth the next step to uh, to uh, colonize would be inside the human body like genomes and also genomes of all the other species and uh, this uh, another series of works that I kind of <laughs> unite under lab rats but uh, it could be also um, called something else uh, is it is a um, um, next step from uh, what I just talked about and and I'm going specifically into the field of scientific um, uh, representations of animals. Um, instead of kind of attention economy, uh, thinking about the amount of um, images that exist in the laboratory context, uh, kind of the industrial scale of, of uh, laboratory research on certain model organisms like fruit flies and uh, worms and mice and rats and whatnot and bacteria obviously and uh, fish and all kinds of things and uh, the, the sort of the 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 opposite uh, utility of it uh, from you know these the image of these beautiful penguins that I showed in the beginning but at the same time the same material it's just JPEGs on a on a on a on a data drive somewhere on a server and also uh, it's still images of living things these just things that are not uh, um, seen as beautiful but they're seen as uh, utilitarian um, and in uh, and I specifically focused on fruit flies and uh, this warm sea elegance um, and see elegance for me this uh, this little worm that you see here on the left um it's uh, it was one of the first uh, it's the first animal whose genome was fully sequenced and it's the first uh, uh animal whose uh connectome whose nervous system was fully mapped at least in terms of uh cells and uh, it's sort of like a cyborgian example of the of an animal that is uh, being constantly genetically modified and and explored for our kind of our human medical um, um biomedical research purposes and i also thought it's interesting that the elegance has this um, shape of an arrow and so they're kind of being uh, their pattern of activation of themselves they're transparent and whatever research is being done on them, um, you can see it under a microscope. Their body is transparent, so if you genetically modify them, you can almost um, visually see directly uh, the changes that happened, and so sort of, they become their own kind of scientific graphs. And they're also agents of um, biotechnological industries and kind of thus capitalism. Um, these are the installations that I made using specific, focusing specifically on C. elegance. Um, and I, I somehow had an obsession about them for a few years. <laughs> and the installation got out more and more out of control. <laughs> um, and going back to Paradise Lost, this sort of... Uh, the introduction of these more synthetic beings into the into life you know by by continuous laboratory mutation uh experiments it sort of in, almost reintroduced a new type of eden uh, uh into our world which is kind of unpredictable and artificial almost and i'll get back to this 
these are examples of sculptures that I did with uh, fruit flies. Uh, this is um, an embryo of a mouse. Uh, this is a human embryo edited by CRISPR technology. <laughs> um, this is a, um, a vulture. Yeah. And I kind of made the installations also more and more complex, combining different sculptures and adding um, lines of text that I would find in scientific papers uh, and graphs that I would find in scientific papers um, in relation to, to this uh, expansion of human spaces idea. Uh, um, and these phrases are all, for me, kind of pointers to the story that I'm trying to tell to, and the way to capture um, the story. Uh, these are just maybe I'll skip these. Um, and so, thinking about the uh, this uh, combination of biological life forms that are um, the, that are being manipulated in, in laboratories, and the trend towards uh, increasing use of artificial intelligence and uh, robotics, I wanted to make something that looks like a, a weird um, um, artificial robotic life form. Uh, and this became a series of um, sculptures that I made using um, baby equipment and specifically baby uh, electronic baby swings and also scientific images that I translated into uh, resin uh, that kind of looks like a um, membrane type of um, um, material, kind of membranes that are that are stuck or kind of fossilized in uh, in in a static shapes, in solid shapes, and uh, this became for me a way to sort of combine all the the existing narratives into something that is more sci-fi or more like speculative. Uh, these things are not fully functional robots, but they sort of point to a moment in time where um, something organic can, can cr cross over with something mechanical and gain uh, some sort of sentience or um, biological autonomy. Um, these are just uh, close-ups of these sculptures. Uh, and they also became part of installations uh, that were <clears throat> kind of activated by sound and uh, and uh, pr projections and one of the important aspects for me of these works were that they all had uh, some form of eyes some form of uh, um, in this case kind of laser pointers that uh, would be used to scan their environment uh, like a lot of current robotic uh, like robots do. Um, and I specifically wanted to imagine uh, the environment, like the installations as environments that they um, inhabit, but also that they're constantly scanning. Uh, and in this case, the, the model of installation became that uh, these robotic uh, uh, creatures are looking at PowerPoint presentations, let's say, of something that they have to study. Um, and what I thought would be the most interesting for them to study uh, would be <laughs> uh, a series of images that became another work uh, project, and I call them generally earthwares. And these are images that were taken by automatic cameras in, in the wild. Uh, the cameras that are uh, being positioned in um, a lot of uh, forests and uh, savannas and uh, rainforests and deserts of the world to study um, the abundance of certain species of animals uh, and trace kind of uh, movement of animals and biodiversity. And what I find fascinating about these images is that they're also created by automatic cameras 
in hundreds of thousands um, and they're not really meant to be seen by people. Uh, uh, so the images before that I worked with, the beautiful viral images, they were meant to be seen by people. Uh, the laboratory images, they're meant to be seen by scientists maybe. And these images, they're sort of meant to be seen mostly by um, algorithms and people who train the algorithms. And uh, uh, I, I helped to train these algorithms on kind of... Um, citizen science platforms where you're asked to classify these images uh, so that uh, once there's enough classifications an algorithm can be uh, written uh, so that sort of AI can classify these images and specifically animals in them and I classified around 7,000 of these images and I um, somehow was imagining myself as you know a human, but also as a machine trying to uh, identify a living creature in this in just a pixelated um, matrix that is a this a, that is a digital image. Um, and I always thought I always kind of found all these artifacts peculiar and blurriness and the night um, flash vision and. Um, and all these sort of unpredictable little uh, things that make compositions really strong and um, and patterns that match in an in a sort of um, in a fascinating way when it comes to actually like thinking of how a, a tree matches a pattern on the animal and things like this like on this picture and I specifically uh, then kind of connected it all back together to um, this idea of a cutout, you know, that you see a signal in an image like an animal and you visually outline it uh, the same way an algorithm would do. And you cut it out and you somehow present it as a, as a separate signal. And that's what I was doing before, kind of having even an interest in any of the machine vision uh, topics. Um, so I also started to make kind of the sculptures using this night uh, vision uh, or this this uh, automatic trail camera photos, um, and it became large installations where the light and kind of the mechanics of it played a big role, and also kind of again tying it all together with the. Um, with uh, graphs and texts and uh, things like this. Um, and again, going back to this idea of a machine vision, um, I want some of the data sets were interesting that I analyzed. And this was a data set that was a pictures they taken by a, a drone flying at night over uh some savanna and taking um these heat vision photos of animals and there's also people who um got caught by it um and i um sort of started also to think about a vision that exists in other spectrum or in other modes of vision than just human uh, or even machine uh, and a mix of a, a machine and um, non-human vision. For example, this is an image of uh, how approximately a dolphin would see a human being. And this is a picture of um, how approximately a self-driving car would see a deer crossing the street, a road at night. Uh, and these pixelations and the artifacts of the image, they they almost point to like a, um, that the humans are not the ones who are supposed who are sort of see, supposed to be seeing these images. Um, this is just a pixelated. This is the, not a model of anybody's vision. This is just some one of the images I found in the data set that looked high, very pixelated, but also almost psychedelic. Um, and it reminded me of. Um, uh, we see the earliest art types of art, uh, the the materially corrupted uh, through tens of thousands of years images uh, of ochre paint on a cave wall that are 
almost look as identical in a way to the uh, 2021 pixelated deer. And I um, decided to combine all these references into, into one type of an artwork series where I took the images that were uh, taken by self-driving car of this deer and I uh, printed them on a synthetic clay, uh, transferred them on a synthetic clay that had a natural material corruption to it. Um, and I started to make kind of a series of works using this material that is very synthetic, but also it's clay. Uh, it reminds you of the cave uh, art. It also just reminds you of, a, um, of some low resolution uh, image. Um, there will be more of this, but I will later, I think, of the series. Um, one um, next step, I, next jump I did <laughs> in my practice was to um, introduce um, something like a, like a human presence element back into the work. Uh, and we did it uh, in a collaboration with Power Studio, which is an artist studio in Berlin. Um, and what I basically asked them was to make, to generate using algorithmic processes, some type of like a cave art stick figure um, series. And we took a scientific paper that I uh, analyzed, that used uh, algorithmic uh, like machine vision to analyze images of Italian uh, cave art. And we sort of abused it into our own purpose and train a little algorithm on uh, using this uh, um, kind of scientific paper and also using different source uh, images like the shape of a Dubai island, uh, brain cells and uh, some other references. Um, and we managed to generate um, uh, several hundred of these like uh, stick figures that are mix animals mixed with human figures sort of hunters mixed with prey, um, shamans mixed with uh, um, hunt, yeah, abstract symbols. Uh, and I decided to sort of insert them into the, into the trail camera photos uh, as almost like a confrontational um, moment of this animal um, encountering a human spirit or kind of a human presence that is still embedded into the scene because although it's an automatic trail camera there's no photographer the camera itself is almost substitutes like a presence of a of kind of a human with all our with all the baggage that that entails and i thought it's just there's something again in terms of as a pattern of activation it's a weird combination and uh I made a bunch of these again as this sort of um, old fresco um, uh, earthware pieces. Uh, and this was all together in an installation uh, from 2009. This is kind of how it all comes together in these installations where we have uh, um, references to um, lab rats and references to. Uh, expansion of human spaces and references to images as a, way, a form of mapping of this expansion. And the last project I will talk about is sort of the most recent one, uh, a microbial oasis. And um, this was um, uh, for me to follow my interest of thinking about um, uh, also scientific models as a forms of um, photographs almost um, and scientific for models as a form of uh, image making and kind of again patterns of activation that are meant either for scientists or for machines to to be processed uh, by and i got specifically interested in interested in combination of artificial intelligence and um, um, biology uh, and in this case 
the trigger for the project was this Google's AlphaFold uh, algorithm announcement that they claimed to learn to learn how to fold protein structures better than um, uh, any like scientists can and better than other previous algorithms um, that try to do so. And what that meant was basically um, a transformation of uh, of um, kind of genetic um, or kind of protein research into uh, a data science problem. Uh, and this relationship between kind of translating something that is a living uh, of kind of organic uh, entity like a protein or amino acid into a set of code and codes and letters and then instead of in, into sets of zeros and ones and uh, and then extrapolation of an image out of that so kind of from biology to an image uh, uh, trajectory I found that very uh, fascinating and all the kind of the translation uh, aspect of it. And I wanted to sim like simulate that to almost make my own experiment around that. Uh, and I collaborated with the artist called Max Kreis to Maximilian Kreis to, to do that. And we went to a protein data bank uh, database online that is a public data set uh, database uh, for scientific models of viruses and proteins and enzymes and uh, all kinds of things. Um, we scraped it. So we just kind of took for free what was out there. Um, this was our uh, scraped folder. Uh, and then we used some what they call AI style GAN algorithm to generate uh, new forms. So sort of to generate synthetic uh, virus forms and synthetic protein forms from already existing ones using some kind of algorithmic process. And a lot of them looked sort of interesting and sort of realistic. But what was not expected for us was that uh, maybe 1% of them or maybe even less than 1% of them ended up looking like uh, human faces or just faces or just masks in general. Um, and this was not in our, there was no faces in our training data and there was no, um, it was never uh, explicitly coded to be there. So we assumed that we sort of discovered a bias towards a human uh, form in the algorithm itself. Um, and also, again, as the same with the stick figures, it's just there was this in, in kind of an objective way uh, experiment to synthesize some sort of um, new, you know, some sort of virus shapes or neut neutral uh, uh, weird protein shapes. All of a sudden, we got a bunch of human uh, presence again. And then I decided to use these faces as kind of portraits and make a portrait show, portrait series of, um, uh, of them, uh, again, using juxtaposition of the faces with um, certain scientific graphs and messages that I, I found in relation to the topic. Um, and it became a, a portrait exhibition, like a group in a a portrait exhibition in a <laughs> in a building that used to be a military arsenal, uh, and at the center of the exhibition was um, also a video uh, that was basically like a petri dish. But instead of bacteria, we had animations of these um, um, algorithmic. Uh, mutations of uh, of patterns that looked like proteins and viruses and faces and it was almost like uh, uh, arguably um, uh, almost like a theater set of a of an actual military arsenal you would find in the 21st century kind of of uh, bio biological weapons and uh, um, weapons that are using artificial intelligence <laughs> Um, and I think that's sadly very up to our um, 
news uh, cycle uh, this week where all of a sudden everybody's talking about uh, bio biological weapons in secret labs and accusing each other of having them. <laughs> um, and the last thing, this is an NFT project I did using also the results of this um, uh, experiment. Um, and we made a, uh, I made a bunch of um, NFTs that were basically a project called Mutagen. It's a, it's a collaboration with several other people, but the core is that we, that by participating uh, in the blockchain uh, um, through like trading and um, buying and such, uh, the image would be, you would be evolving the image. And so the, this relation, this sort of idea of a static image um, is gone and a new type of image is introduced um, that is uh, directly dependent to, dependent on how uh, you interact with it. So for example, uh, you buy, uh, you mint, you buy like a, uh, the image on the left and um, uh, you sell it and the, activ the activation of the process of selling itself uh, mutates the image towards something else. So the person who gets it, it they already get the new image. gift I made um, for uh, as another NFT project. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll stop maybe sharing or I can still continue sharing if you want me to refer to something. Thank you very much for the um, for your talk. And um, I um, I think it's really I just have a, a small comment. Is, is there any question here? There's one question, maybe. Thank you for for a very nice talk. I mean, all those things are very interesting. I like how you how you acquire the the tools that that are used in in biology and, and you play with them. Uh, uh, I mean, like, but you do your. I mean, it's serious, but uh, uh, it must have be a fun. Have you have you tried to check whether these uh, proteins that you have uh, uh, synthesized in silico uh, uh, can can be functional H have you looked at this uh, or have, have you done anything like this uh, thank you for your question um, I I showed them to a couple of like um, microbiologists and they said yeah they look interesting but I don't think they look yet fully applicable uh, like functional i think actually the new generation of um of uh, um, ai image production like uh dal e that uh, open ai published last year and a uh, clip these uh these uh, technologies they will actually enable me and i will tr do this experiment uh, again soon to to make them even more actually like realistic or probable and I think that will be more interesting. These are look very realistic if you just kind of look on the surface. If you start thinking about it, they're probably not very realistic. But uh, there are already tools to make them actually probable and actually functional almost. And I would do I would think I will continue with the experiment towards that. But also I think there's many already actual ways that um, scientists do, are using uh, AI to like generate. Uh, proteins and uh, you know on a very hyper professional level and for me it's just about kind of um, this idea that anybody can do it the same way you know maybe I can maybe something maybe one of the uh, images that I generated actually will be somehow practically viable and statistically it's possible so it's definitely possible but nobody really checked all of them because there's thousands and thousands um yeah and sorry i i just wanted to make a remark i i would love to be there in person because i always feel like the zoom talks i'm i'm a bit autistic i'm just talking in this uh on, into my computer and so i i have no idea what really translates into the into the space <laughs> but 
Uh, so yeah, you can anybody can ask any question if something left uh, unclear or. Well, thank you very much. Well, uh, it's a strange time to uh, uh, that. Uh, but anyway, I, I wanted to ask also uh, if if you were thinking about that. Uh, you were talking that some of the pictures are meant to, uh, for for not for the human eye, and mm -hmm. also with, with these proteins that you have uh, synthesized that. Uh, actually, you are seeing something new for uh, or or for the first time that nobody actually seen. Like with the pictures, you are seeing animals that uh, nobody were checking. So you are seeing these animals that that, uh, that are doing something in their lives, and then you you are the first one to see them because before only computer check them. Mm -hmm. now with the proteins, is something like uh, that uh, you created. And uh, there could be a discovery in it. So how, how do you feel about these things? Well, this is what I mentioned with like um, images as a form of mapping. So what, you, what you're mapping is something that is like terra incognita, you know, you're going into a frontier and you have to map something. And this is a form of mapping. And even with proteins, you're, uh, you're mapping the possibilities. And maybe one of them will be a real thing. But you're just kind of creating uh, possible models of what could be out there. Uh, you know, this idea, for example, that how scientists are trying to design life that doesn't depend on water and oxygen. And so they're just trying to map a possibility. And that I'm doing this with like the generation of these shapes, of virus shapes, or protein shapes. And with the animals, I, I, um, I agree, like how I thought about it is also like a, almost a, yeah, the, that it's almost intruding into the wilderness. It's again, this, uh, the loss of paradise, you know, there's this beautiful deer somewhere in the forest and it has this beautiful life and it doesn't, it, there's no sort of media involved. And, and all of a sudden there's this camera object that does snap every, you know, that does snap and almost catch, almost hunt this animal into our yeah, awareness. And the animal was not asking to be <laughs> hunted. So yeah, there's this form of almost, it's, although it's very harmless, it's still like a, in a violent intrusion into their space, I think. And it's interesting because more and less and less spaces on earth are given like a, uh, a freedom to just be because even you know there's always some form of like surveillance or image making everywhere or sound to capturing or genetic capturing so I, I find that interesting I'm not like judging that it's wrong I'm just saying this is what's happening and then me I'm this kind of I'm just taking a position of the filter or like a um, the labor who does the who connects it to the algorithm or who filters it out, out of like hundreds of less interesting uh, um, uh, data points. For example, for me to generate this, uh, you know, image that, you, that you're looking at now, this um, variety of uh, my results, I, I looked through probably thousands of very boring results. <laughs> So I'm like the, I'm the, I'm the artist who makes the experiment, but also I'm the artist who just filters the results into something interesting. Like here, you can see there's a lot of less interesting um, uh, shapes. So this is kind of what I'm. Um, uh, but of course, I'm also like a, not a neutral entity. I'm like a biased uh, human entity that makes these choices. So I just want to go back to the some of these. Uh, animal photos. Mm. Yeah, there's just this uh, some moments I find it truly beautiful. And that's another that's another aspect is that I I'm also trying to find beauty in 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 domains that are not supposed to have any or kind of that are just made for utilitarian reasons and then all, all of a sudden there's this sublime image that you encounter or you know something that is very 
like a pattern that is very special in in like a pile of garbage or something like that. So, so maybe. I think I think your your work is particularly interesting because you you were you began on in this in the invisible side of the internet. I mean not physical side of the internet and you somehow uh, emerge into the physical space and now you're somehow moving backwards to the so you're moving back and forth the, the virtual space and the physical space at the same time you're kind of challenging the what harari calls like the the, the challenges of the 21st century are the uh, uh, the um, the global uh, environmental change and the climate climate crisis and the the algorithms the internet is taking over somehow in our lives but so i think you're playing this game it's a kind of a prototype of, of like a future thinking maybe somehow yeah, or i'm just kind of taking what's already out there and trying to process it in a way that maybe it hasn't been fully processed yet and that's like nothing every really epic but i'm I just have this instinct of like, okay, let's let's really just look deeper a little bit into this, and and uh, specifically, I also gravitate towards in work relation in relation to animals and um, bacteria and like proteins and living creatures because I sort of think to um, to directly in, uh, address. Uh, this through kind of looking at human uh, social uh, angle is very heavy. It's like it's a whole different game. And also um, because I think some of these non-human topics are underlooked. Uh, for example, like this whole domain of laboratory animal um, uh, topic. Um, so I sort of try to uh, bring something that I think is under uh, scrutinized on the surface a bit. And also, I think with the protein thing, I think this topic of, um, especially it became very clear with Corona, all of a sudden everybody had to be aware of what is RNA vaccine and what are spike proteins and what and who owns what, you know, what company owns or what spike protein and who in which lab is developing what. And I think 21st century will, looking back at it, will be defined by this, uh, by the, by the, uh by the kind of biology basically <laughs> biology that is uh that is uh, deeply connected to computation computational biology uh because it's somehow i think will define a lot of things uh, going further uh with medicine and with um uh, with stuff and then there's this aspect that I find like academically interesting is relationship between biology and and an image or data set and then uh, I think this is sort of the, re the this is where I'm trying to get into uh, from this aspect of a still an image and a, a pattern of activation that activates either human or a body or an algorithm um, so yeah and maybe I'll go towards actually like printing biomatter at some point, I don't know, to make sculpture. <laughs> okay. Katya, thank you very much for your contribution.